Good morning and welcome to the Undesign the Red Line exhibition. Designing the We is really excited to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Fair Housing Act through the installation of this exhibition at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, the exhibit launched in 2015 as part of my company Designing the We's manifesto in action. We felt as design practitioners, as transdisciplinary designers, city planners, architects, policy um, uh, professionals, that there was sort of this Tower of Babel, that people didn't understand sort of this anthropological lens or historical context of how we get to the point of disparities and inequities today, particularly around housing and wealth. And we felt that we needed to ground this conversation in order to understand then how do we design and what is the role of design in the built environment to create a more just and inclusive human experience. So we launched the Undesign the Red Line exhibition. What we have here is a map of the Bronx, um, one of 239 maps that were created under the New Deal. Um, two sister agencies are created, um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration. The Homeowners Loan Corporation is the agency that's created to make these maps. Why was the Homeowners Loan Corporation created? Was that house, or home ownership or the opportunities to buy your home were only available um, to those who were wealthy prior to the New Deal. Prior to that, you would have to put 30, 50% down on a home and you had five to seven or 10 years um, to purchase um, your home and pay off your mortgage. Mortgages back then were amortized, so you were paying just interest. So typically what people did was they refinanced after the seventh or tenth year. But unfortunately, due to the 1929 market crash, refinancing was not an option. So the federal government under President FDR decided we need to do something to stop the economic hemorrhaging, thus creating the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And the rule and the um, responsibility of the Homeowners Loan Corporation was to go out into communities and sort of autopsy and survey areas that would make, um, that then they could purchase loans to what we know today, the 15 to 30 year loan. So they would purchase them, refinance them, and then extend the terms 15 to 30 years so that people's homes weren't going to be foreclosed upon. However, before they decided to go and do that, they sent surveyors into communities to sort of, again, do an autopsy, to say which areas were going to be safe for this investment and which areas weren't. And there were a range of factors that were considered. Among them was housing quality, transportation, flood zones, um, but also race and ethnicity. And if we were just to look at a map and look at colors, it doesn't tell us the granular. And what really becomes the smoking gun are what we call, um, or what was called area descriptions. Again, these were the surveys that the surveyors used to then um, allocate the colors on this map. And as you can see, one of the questions here asks, what is the detrimental influence? This was an area description that correlated back to the Bronx. And after this question, detrimental influence, you see the words Negro infiltration. So it makes skin color synonymous with the devaluing of property or something to be undesirable. At this time, ethnicities as Irish, Italian, European, Jewish also were considered quote unquote undesirable. Their classification changes after World War II when the census changes. But all, and here's another question that highlights that, E, infiltration of Italian and Negroes. And what this begins to do is create the geographical footprint of America and essentially what we know as the middle class because no other time before were uh, middle class workers able to buy or purchase homes. So we, we now see the explosion of suburbia and as, as people are fleeing and buying into suburbia, we notice that there are, are, um, are, are um, epidemics or issues that begin to rise in what's considered red. The four colors on the um, map, again, are green, which is the best, grade A, followed by blue, B, followed by C, yellow, followed by red. Again, red is considered undesirable and hazardous, and yellow is, will become red in two to three years. Um, what we'd like to show, um, particularly, is that um, we, we forward wind to today, 
Um, and we say, you know, there's this misnomer that if we can control for education, if we can control for employment, if we can control for family income, that actually blacks and whites will perform the same and that all these injustices or inadequacies of the past will be leveled out. But unfortunately, this um, aptly named report called Umbrellas Don't Make Rain really touch upon the fact that that's hogwash. What actually creates a, a, an equalizer or a leveling of a playing field is wealth. And wealth is generated as a result of policies that allowed people to become homeowners. And we know that property is what um, transfers into wealth. And at this time, when you're able to buy homes at very low prices using government subsidies through the Federal Housing Administration and the, H the Homeowners Loan Corporation, you could buy something, let's say, for $10,000, and then it appreciates in value through the generations, and that gets passed down um, to the next generation. And when you, when you carve out large swaths of people from being able to access um, these opportunities, it creates a racial wealth gap because as we know in many of these suburban communities, things like restrictive covenants were very present that pro prohibited people of color from purchasing in these areas. So what the report is saying, if you can actually can control for wealth, education, employment, family income, we will show that blacks or people of color will outperform whites because it's such a huge indicator um, to have discretionary income for those necessities. Um, any questions? Section two of Undesign the Red Line explores different maps and, and we tried to make it interactive. We'd love for people to pin um, where they lived um, and state why they moved or why do they live there now. We have a couple of maps here. We have a redlining map from Detroit. We have a, a redlining map of the New York City metro area along with northern portions of New Jersey and we have one from Richmond, Virginia. And then we have another section over here that we'll go into shortly around Washington, DC. And what we use this area as is just to show the magnitude and just the different area descriptions of how people viewed um, others. And again, we'd like to reiterate that it wasn't that racial zoning or racial prejudices didn't exist prior to the New Deal, but what we're talking about here is the fact that people who are put in positions of authority to uphold the ideologies and principles of democracy are making decisions based on prejudices and, and, and other factors to dehumanize people who didn't look a certain way. And that creates a stigma and a perception that today we're still dealing with um, to undesign or undo. Um, so as I, I shared in section one, we understand that the Homeowners Loan Corporation creates this map, and they're, and they're mostly a lot in northern cities because the South had Jim Crow, so you really didn't necessarily need um, maps. And what ends up happening is the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, ends up adopting the methodology of the Homeowners Loan Corporation. But the Federal Housing Administration takes it a step further. And what they basically state is that even areas that don't have a map, and as I explained earlier, we know 239 of these maps were created. What we're going to do is create a federal underwriting manual that basically stipulates who will be in areas, who in which areas will be um, eligible for support and which um, areas will not be eligible um, for support. And they had various stipulations and I'm going to share one with you. Basically stating, <clears throat> for example, the evaluator should investigate areas surrounding the location to determine whether or not incompatible racial and social groups are present to the end that an intelligent prediction may be made regarding the possibility or probability of the location being invaded by such groups. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. So this is now the federal government essentially sanctioning how se segregation is going to form in a, a developing um, um, nation that for the first time is injecting itself, the government, into 
housing and development and all of these aspects that really inform the daily lives of American citizens. And what this ends up doing is fueling a vast and powerful machine. Again, as I mentioned before, it isn't just about home ownership opportunities. It's really about how, one, you view human beings, Two, what areas then are, are invested in and which areas aren't? And we see school closings. We see infrastructure um, deteriorate. And we see that as that's deteriorating in, section, in certain sections, it's building up in others. So the, 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 the machine is in full motion, in full swing. And what does that mean? Is that it was highly profitable to begin the suburbanization of America, to begin the development, because you needed the roadways to get there. You needed the, so the asphalt industry, the rubber industry, the automobile industry, the lumber industry, the appliance industry, the design industry, the architect industry, were all feeding off of a machine that was being highly subsidized by the federal government uh, and, and amongst others. And what that ends up doing is even in instances, and we have an example in Baltimore, that the lobbying groups, because of the profit, because of the power, are even telling eight city agencies and state agencies to cease and desist um, any type of social or public housing program because it's in direct competition with their private interests because they wanted people to buy homes. E even though acknowledging that the urbans were be, uh, urban areas were becoming the pariah zones, even acknowledging that the people who were confined into those areas were people of color. And again, you know, people of color encompasses everything that's non-white to a certain point in our nation's history, and then we have people who are able to assimilate. This is an example of a textbook, and to show how insidious the, the practice comes, this is from the National Association of Real Estate Boards, as they even begin steering um, uh, communities and, and controlling, and this basically states, the colored people certainly have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but they must recognize the economic disturbance which their presence in a white neighborhood causes and forego their desire to split off from the established district where the rest of their race lives. It is, it, you know, again, it's something that gets to the core of what our democracy is about, that we can have these macro systems that really dehumanize and devalue people, understanding that housing is a, is a basic human need. Shelter is a basic human need. And while we have all of these complexities, what hovers above this all is our humanity. And it's putting into question, how do we even see people? How do we even see communities? And how do we design very differently? So that again, as I mentioned before, we create more just and inclusive human experiences. This is, um, you know, at your leisure, you should come in and, and, and read the different area descriptions. And if we, and again, if we are to overlay areas of today, we will see areas that have suffered enormous disinvestment through time. Um, you will see the issues and the collateral consequences uh, of many decisions that were made as far back as 1933. What we have here is another portion of Section 2 that is Washington, D.C. specific and focuses on Washington, D.C. Um, some people believe that a redlining map was created of Washington, D.C. Some don't, but the reality is there is nothing in the file sleeve at the National Archives. So what we have shown here is a different representation to just show how communities are um, segregated or where populations lived and the overlay um, of, of what the conditions were of those communities. So if you were, this is a Sanborn map, which was a company that made maps, not the redlining maps, but they made maps of areas. Um, and people are pitting here where they live. And the act, it's ironic that the colors are pretty much similar um, to that of a redlining map. Um, and this shows the, the grid of Washington, D.C. And then this map here talks about the dwellings that are occupied by people other than white. And then we have a few maps that show where the blighted areas are um, in Washington, D.C., as well as where rezoning and clearance needs to happen. And when you overlay all those maps, again, it paints a vivid picture of who, which demographics were at the, core, at, the, at the center or focus of, again, either uh, slum, quote unquote, slum clearance or, or disinvestment.
and it's a great tool to really begin understanding what communities were like, what the histories were, and, 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 and following that trajectory. Again, as particularly today, we see rapid transitioning of areas that had once been disinvested. Um, section three is a really exciting part of the um, Undesign the Red Line exhibition, particularly because not only do we put redlining in its proper historical context, but, but we show sort of what was happening before redlining and what then are collateral consequences thereafter. And as I mentioned before, the top of the timeline again shows systems and structures interconnecting with each other and spiraling towards to our present day experiences. And the bottom of the timeline is responding back, grassroots movements, groundswells that are, are, are reflecting or, or pushing these, these macro systems. The line here, this red line of, on the timeline, is where people share their thoughts and reflections around what, the material, what they feel about the materials that they're reading, um, things that may be missing, because obviously we can't put everything um, on here. Each of these pop-outs that you see on the timeline capture really specific local stories of macro themes, for example, what did urban renewal mean in places like Washington, D.C.? What did white flight or subsidizing suburbia mean in places like New York? Um, so it gives familiarity and humanizes a lot of these stories. And again, it's important to understand what the climate was that leads us into one of the greatest social policies in this history, the New Deal. Many of us like to subscribe to this mentality that my family came over with $50 in their pocket, or we pulled ourselves up by the bootstraps and we made it and that any type of attempt to try to give resources to create more of a level playing field in America is a socialist type of program. Meanwhile, not understanding the New Deal, as I mentioned before, through the FHA and through the HOLC, ends up creating what we know as the American middle class. Um, so, of course, we can go way before the 1800s, but we start with slavery and the Civil War and understanding that we had two subsequent Civil Rights Acts that come out of that during the era of Reconstruction that guarantee housing um, as a human right or non-discrimination towards trying to get education and things of that nature. We didn't need subsequent Civil Rights Act because it captures what we know and understand to be, again, the ideologies and principles of our democracy. Um, so we know that there's a great compromise in 1877 where President Rutherford B. Hayes um, has, wins the popular vote but loses the electoral college or the electoral college was contested. And there was a, a compromise that's made between the Southern Dixiecrats um, and the Radical Republicans. And that was basically that they would um, allow the Radical Republicans to take the election, but if they get reinstituted back into power. Um, so that means what the work of the Freedmen's Bureau around um, parceling out lands um, to give to those who were formerly enslaved, all of that now is off the table. And, and, and um, not only are the lands given back to former plantation owners and those of the South, but they're also given political power um, in, 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 in this whole paradigm and dynamic. Um, so even though as we're making progress or reconstruction in the Freedmen's Bureau, we know that there's um, conditions called the black codes that are now being implemented. So it was ways to really try to chisel back any types of advancements that the Civil War and, and um, the, the Civil Rights Acts of the 1800s, late 1800s brought about. Um, and what were black codes? Most of us don't know what black codes are, but black codes were um, codes that were put in place to, re, to criminalize minor offenses, essentially. There's a book called Slavery by Another Name. So after we fight this war to really create some equal grounding and actualize this rhetoric of change, um, we know that many people begin, if you didn't pay your taxes or poll tax, if you were loitering, again, minor offenses were heavily criminalized. And states and counties begin to profit from this because those who were just freed are now being put into what was called the convict leasing system. And the convict leasing system would put you right back on the plantations that you were just freed from. So it really creates a dynamic where particularly men of color could not integrate into economies uh, despite the racism that existed um, at that time. And again, just chiseling to find ways to control and constrain um, individuals who were just seeking to actualize again um, their rights as American citizens. Um, we know Jim Crow, 
happens. We know Asian Exclusion Acts begin to happen to um, formulate and, and, and change geographies. And the Asian Exclusion Acts um, derived from California, where basically Chinese laundry workers were trying to be removed from their businesses that they have held for generations. And they actually fight in this case, and they're, uh, they're, the court, they had a recourse with the court, and they were actually allowed to stay um, in their properties. But as this is happening, um, we know that there's something called the rise of scientific racism and eugenics. And you know, we wholeheartedly believe that these are, um, this is really at the core of what we're getting at. Because a lot of the things like redlining and urban renewal and all the other stuff that's happening um, are symptoms. And what does scientific racism mean and eugenics? Was that you would have people, uh, thought leaders of the time, you'd have universities that then talk about um, that there is this supreme race and that this supreme race um, is of value and everything else is not and everything else is actually subhuman. And it creates a stigma and a perception that then allows us to begin to disconnect from anything that looks different from ourselves to say that it's okay that you live in the conditions that you live in because you're not a human being. One of the most famous um, eugenicists was Madison Grant. Madison Grant was a mentor to Teddy Roosevelt. Madison Grant oversaw the construction of the Bronx Zoo, the northern portion of the Bronx River Parkway, um, also founded many of our national parks and founded the Wildlife Conservation Society. But Madison Grant also wrote a book called The Passing of the Great Race. And that book was so powerful to em emphasize white supremacy that Hitler writes him a thank you letter stating how he, and uses this ideology to promote his mass genocide during World War II. So as this begins to seep into the mindsets of people, that now it isn't just about where it's a class issue, it's now a class issue along with the socially constructed race issue that makes people other and devalue. And we know that we have Plessy versus Ferguson um, that, that reinforces the Jim Crow mentality of the South. We are very familiar with the Great Migration. And as, as again, we unleash this racial terrorism um, in our country with, again, devaluing um, human beings and the removal of the front line to federal troops from the Compromise of 1877, we know in places like Baltimore, Mayor Mahul passes the first racial zoning ordinances. And the, those zoning ordinances basically stipulate that if you're black, you live here. If you're white, you live here. And it's sort of the precursor of redlining maps. We are, many of us are familiar with the Great Migration, but I highly recommend you reading about Sundown Towns. It's a book by James Lowen that talks about the Great Retreat, that in northern portions of um, rural America, it wasn't all white and apple pie or cherry pie, with pick, take your pick, but it was actually integrated, and the census records show that. But we know in places like Tulsa, um, Oklahoma, what ends up happening even as people of color create insular communities um, to try to ascribe to um, uh, having a basic human needs met. Um, we know that the Niagara movement happens with W.E.B. Du Bois as lynchings begin to rise, which becomes the NAACP. And this is the energy with Woodrow Wilson segregating federal jobs, screening the birth of a nation at the White House, that we enter into the New Deal. And the New Deal, again, is responsible for the greatest social safety net policies, essentially creates the middle class because of its lending practices, creates social security that we are then able to buy into. Um, and, 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 but what were the two industries that were not allowed to pay into or did not pay into um, social security? Share crop or farmers and domestic servants. At that time, who were people that predominantly made up um, farmers and domestic servants. They will argue that it wasn't racial, racially motivated. Um, it was more administrative um, uh, capacity to be able to enforce that. Either way, certain people got the opportunity to build into a retirement plan while others did not. That really then affects our ability to access, what are, again, basic human needs. We know we have our civil rights movement. We have the Young Negro Cooperative League. And now redlining comes in. We have the subsequent housing acts that basically stipulate how we're going to, for example, build future public housing. That at this point in 1937 forward, public housing will be segregated. We have the National Housing Act of 1949 that tees up communities um, for urban renewal and some clearance. 
um, and, and how do areas become what they become is we have things like blockbusting happening. Um, Edmund Park in Baltimore is a very famous case. And what was blockbusting? As we begin, particularly after World War II, with this rapid development of suburbia and housing opportunities um, in America, we know that we would have blockbusters come in, have a black family move in, or a black family walk with a um, baby carriage down the community, and they would go to a white homeowner and says, your neighborhood is going to decline in value because there's certain undesirable elements that are moving in. And when, when the white, owner, white homeowner would, would refuse to sell, they would say, that's fine. We will, we'll come back in two weeks and we'll get it for a bargain from you because er this area will decline. <coughs> Excuse me. And what does that mean? That means that as they were signing the ink and eventually reneging into buying or, or um, saying, you know, fine, I don't want to lose any more value on my home. I'll just buy, I'll just sell, and then I'll buy in the suburbs. And that same blockbuster would then turn around and sell the house to a black family. And, and sell, sell is in quotations because people of color were not allowed to obtain mortgages. So what they had to do was a contract buy. And the contract buy essentially was you didn't full own, outright own the home, you would do payments. But if you missed one payment, you would lose it all. And they flipped that same house over and over and over again to different people. Um, and, and it just shows, again, the predatorial practices that existed as people were trying to find opportunities to house their families. And, and in Chicago, they actually start the um, Home Buyers Club because they didn't have recourse in, in the court systems. And again, this is the energy that we find ourselves into um, as neighborhoods begin to be disinvested in. You can't obtain mortgages. You can't um, have equity borrow money to fix your roof or fix the roadways or um, spiff up your businesses. When places begin to look, quote unquote, blighted, although the community is still close knit, it becomes a reason to say, we're going to clear these areas. And, and Robert uh, Moses, being most famous in places like New York, cleared massive areas that they deemed to be slums to build our nation's highways through. And Negro, uh, urban renewal, excuse me, was also known as Negro um, removal. And instead of questioning why our communities look a certain way because of this trajectory or long history, what we do is we begin to blame the people there and again reinforce the perception that communities look a certain way because people of color or others who are in these disinvested areas, it's somehow their fault that it's making it this way. Um, and we know <clears throat> as more and more people, what's called white flight, leaves communities, um, there's increasing segregation and there's suburban sprawl. And cities are facing economic challenges because the tax base is no longer there. There's still discrimination in labor practices. So even people of color who are trying to seek to get employment still just don't have access to those opportunities. So when you don't have access to those opportunities, you, you don't have the resources to come and spend and circulate that dollar um, within the community. We, we know that capital flight ends up happening and that's globalization where other um, businesses either leave communities or shut down um, or go in abroad to other countries. And, and you know, there's a boiling point um, as communities are experiencing this. Some call them riots, some call them uprisings. And what, whatever your, your, your take on it is, the fact is we, we see massive um, civil uh, disruption across America because people are tired of the conditions um, that they're living under. And on the heels of these uprisings, what are we seeing? We're seeing epidemics like heroin. On the heels of er heroin, we see HIV AIDS. On the heels of HIV AIDS, we see crack. And on the heels of crack, we see unprecedented violence in our communities. And what this leads is to a, a tremendous unraveling of a social fabric um, in our community. And even though communities are responding back and trying to, to buy buildings, creating building clubs, um, it's still so massive because the take is people here are the problem. And planned shrinkage, which is another policy, is basically removing uh, resources from communities. Um, and instead of pouring in the resources that are necessary, they begin taking them um, away. And we see the rise of neoliberal policies. And neoliberal policies are saying, despite this history, Despite the fact that you know we're pouring money in, as we see now, the heroin crisis is more of a public health issue. Back then, it was a criminal issue. 
as a result of this, um, we're going, you know, you could do it. You could just say no to drugs. You can find a way to tell your landlord that you shouldn't live um, a certain way. But it all um, comes into the fact that, again, who's considered valuable and who isn't in these areas. And when our communities look like this, this is Jimmy Carter. Um, this is, we know we have policies like war on drugs, broken windows, um, unhealed trauma. We have movements happening. We have foreclosure crises. And what this timeline is representing is just all of these systems. And now that investment is returning into these areas that were once disenfranchised, we don't look at this long history. It isn't just about displacement of people. It is about displacements of culture or, or the greenwashing of a, a comp the Americana, of the complexity of our Americana. We don't like to look into what gets us to the points we are. And, and when these um, Black Lives Matter movements are, are rising, it isn't because only because uh, police officers um, uh, uh, or law enforcement issues are happening. What it is is a whole entire history that leads us to this point that shows the continued dehumanization of human beings based on the color of their skin. From section three, um, we go into section four that talks about stories of the line um, that really, again, pulls out from the timeline that we just looked at and, um, and talks about specific stories. What's exciting about this section for the 1968 commemoration of the signing of the Fair Housing Act, we looked at something called In Pursuit of Home and the Road to Fair Housing. I'd like to read a quote from a book um, that we uh, use to give sort of a context and the value of fair housing. And it states, the nation's problem of fair housing have not been widely discussed and their complexity not understood. Slogans like forced housing and open housing are used as substitutes for rational analysis. Judgments of the causes of housing segregation are often based on unsupported assumptions rather than on documented evidence. There is not even common understanding of the statutory term fair housing, which Congress left undefined. In short, the American people have not been well served by the public discussion of equal housing opportunity. And it opens us up to how did we get to where we are today um, or even in 1968 to this road to fair housing. And what we look upon is very early conditions of overcrowding and public health concerns that really are the impetus in the mid 1800s um, to really create regulation and responses um, to the squalor and blighted conditions of community. And we see that model tenements are the first forms of responses to these conditions that are being looked at upon housing reformers. And then from the model tenements, uh, again, supported by philanthropic um, uh, organizations or individuals, um, leads us into a wider discussion. We have Lyndon B. Johnson's speech, Tarnish on the Violet Crown, that talks about um, the housing conditions of Texas and that in a democratic, uh, again, nation, that these conditions of shacks and, 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 and um, unstable and uh, blighted homes is just not what people want or have, want to have access to in America. And, he ta and FDR talks about the freedom from want, that a stable home really is part of a healthy upbringing um, that opens up many opportunities for individuals. And eventually when the government does get involved with creating the first tenement housing in the Lower East Side of New York, unfortunately areas that were once integrated, um, they build housing instead of responding to human need, they resegregate um, these communities because they make them only accessible um, to certain people. And again, it begins the motion uh, to really unpack and say, is fair housing just for certain people, or is fair housing something for everyone? This road to fair housing here, and the backdrop, you see these bigger tiles that talk about a tumultuous time in our nation's history. And that despite through these tumultuous times, you see people like President Eisenhower, um, JFK, and eventually Lyndon B. Johnson trying to push forth uh, uh, through actions, through legislation, around the democratic principles and ideologies of our democracy. So, as I said, beginning with Eisenhower, um, all the way through into the Fair Housing Act, 
that we have this real backdrop in America history that's chiseling and really questioning what is our democracy, but then popping out that people are still spearheading this through. Um, a, bi a big uh, pivotal moment was in 1965 when LBJ, President Lyndon B. Johnson, creates HUD, um, Housing, um, Housing and Urban Development um, Agency. And, in, and what was very monumental about that, at, given the times, was creating, um, was opening up the position as the secretary to Robert Weaver, who was the first African American that was elected to an executive cabinet in our nation's history. And under his influence and the many others around, really spearheaded an effort that led to, um, unfortunately, um, after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, for LBJ to sit down and write the Fair Housing Act or, and sign it into law. And again, it's, it's, it's a movement, as he states, we have come some of the way, not near all of it. There is much yet to do. And it's not to say that this is the end all or be all, it's this is what does the 1968 Housing Act represent in this larger dynamic of systems to really move us forward to again create accessible housing for all. And this leads us to section five, the final part of the Undesigned the Red Line exhibit. And what we have contended is that if you don't understand sections one through four and the, 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 the road, the journey, the intricacies of what leads us to the most pressing conditions today in our society around housing and education, we can never begin to use design as a tool to really transform what we call our built environment. Everything that we create that's man-made from buildings to policies to roads um, and, and it takes a deeper understanding of these histories to then be able to transform. So this section talks about design as a practice, um, how we're all designers that can really identify places to plug into, again, to really either expand our knowledge and understanding um, or become part of community projects on a very localized level. We talk about that before we can even begin to create outputs into the built environment, we have to build empathy, understanding, and healing. And in doing that, we're, it, 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 it allows us to navigate through a design process that then has the opportunity um, through proof of concept to shift perception. Because right now there is an interplay between perception and what we design and how that design meets human needs. And the interplay creates a lived experience. And if we continue to base our perceptions based on this history, it reinforces a hierarchy of value of who's deserving and who's undeserving. And hopefully, by grounding and contextualizing this information, we're able to promote um, uh, projects and communities that begin to undesign these experiences of race, place, and class that were heavily informed, again, by policies of redlining and urban renewal and planned shrinkage. We are, again, very grateful to be here um, at HUD and really encourage many of you to come see the exhibit and partake with it or even start conversations within your own regions around the importance of fair housing and how do we all come together to really put forth a democracy that's truly reflective of all. Thank you.